Okay, so let's get started then. Uh, so introduce uh, David Ellerman from the University of Ljubljana. Uh, David has written on a dizzying range of topics ranging from economics, mathematics, computer science, information theory, and today will be telling us about information theoretic reconstruction of quantum theory. Okay, thank you, Philip, and the other Philip. I'm going to try to talk uh, most of the talk sitting down. I got a bad back and so forth. But um, the the uh, the background of this talk is in some recent developments, say within the last 15 years, in mathematical logic and in information theory, which then these new developments turned out to be just very adaptable to understand what's going on in quantum mechanics. So the so I'm going to talk initially about the developments in mathematical logic and then the development in information theory. But the thesis <clears throat> is uh, first we separate the unique mathematical framework of quantum mechanics from the physics. And, and that's very important because it's the mathematical framework in quantum mechanics that, that uh, ties into information theory and in, into, into uh, actually mathematical logic. And so <clears throat> The, the new form of mathematical logic is the logic of partitions, that the, the usual form you see in mathematical logic is the Boolean logic of subsets, usually presented only in the special case of the so-called propositional logic. And, and uh, the important thing is that category theoretically, uh, subsets and partitions or member partitions are equivalent to equivalence relations or to quotient sets. And these are dual concepts. So the two logics of subsets, the usual Boolean logic, and the logic of partitions, which has been recent, more recently developed, uh, are dual mathematical logics. And it's the latter one on la the logic of partitions that turns out to be, uh, I'll argue, uh, like the skeleton key to un understand what's going on in the mathematics of, of quantum theory. So we're asking the same questions that other people ask, uh, where does the math come from? Uh, follow the math. Uh, like in economics, we say follow the money and you'll see what's really going on. So you follow the math here and see where the math comes from at the basic logical level. And that's the notion of partitions or equivalence relations or quotient sets, how, however you want to look at it. And the duality between subsets and partitions goes one step lower in the notion of elements of a subset or dual, the notion of distinctions or dits. And that's distinction of a partition is a pair of elements that are in different blocks of the partition. So you remember partitions made up of separate blocks, which are disjoint and which whose union is the whole set. So a pair of ordered pair of elements in different blocks is a distinction. So the partition distinguishes those elements because they're in different blocks. The elements within a block are, are in distinctions or indistinguishable uh, by that partition. So we're dealing with notions here of distinction, indistinction, or in more of the quantum language, distinguishability and indistinguishability are basic logical concepts that will come into this. And both the, of course, uh, subsets of, of uh, universe, universe set, which are used for both, uh, form a lattice. And uh, that's the Boolean lattice. And then you add on the implication you get uh, Boolean algebra. And partitions, it's the same. They form a lattice. And that lattice of partitions was known in the 19th century, uh, both to Dedekind and Ernest Schroeder and, and others. <clears throat> and no new uh, concepts, uh, operations on partitions were developed in the 20th century. And to do logic of partitions, you need at least the implication operation. And, and so this was only developed uh, more, more, more recently. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you some tables here, which shows you uh, how the the duality between these two types of lattices. So elements of a subset are dual to distinctions, dits, if you wish, which are the fundamental notion of information as we see, and uh, the notion of bits is a derived uh, concept. The partial order in the lattice is the inclusion of elements. In the, in the subset lattice, the partial order in the partition lattice uh, is well, what's usually defined as refinement of partitions, but it's actually just inclusion of dits. 
of the it sets of two partitions. <coughs> the join operation, the lattice operation in the lattice of, of uh, subsets is just a union of subsets. And the join operation uh, for partitions is just a union of the two dit sets. So the dit set of the join is the union of the two dit sets of the two partitions. The top of the lattice of uh, subsets is all elements, the universe set. The bottom is the uh, no, null set, no elements. And in the partition lattice, the top of it is the uh, partition called the discrete partition, where all, all the elements are distinguished. So each, each uh, block in the partition is a singleton. And that sort of corresponds to classical reality as we see. And the bottom of the, of the lattice is where everything is mushed together, blobbed together, and that will actually correspond to a pure state, uh, as we'll see. So uh, this partition lattice was developed and published here in, in uh, the, the main logic journal for uh, symbolic logic, for non-classical uh, symbolic logic. So the next question is, okay, you've got the two logics, which are dual and equally fundamental mathematically, so what about the quantitative versions of those two, quantitative version of a subset and the quantitative version of a, uh, <clears throat> of, of a partition? And my mentor in mathematics was MIT professor Jean Calarota. And he always, of course, he knew about the duality between subsets and partitions. And he said that probability is to subsets as information is to partitions. And uh, that's perfectly correct. And so the basic notion of probability, start, this is the Boole Laplace simple finite probability theory, is the probability of a subset is just the cardinality of the subset normalized. And so the we just saw how elements and dits are this duality. So you know already what the definition of information or which I call logical entropy is the normalized <clears throat> number of distinctions of a partition. So, so you take the number of distinctions and you normalize it by dividing by u cross u, and and uh, you do a little calculation here, and you you get that it's actually uh, you can uh, specify it as one minus the sum of the probability squared. The probability is the different blocks uh, in the partition, and uh, this incidentally this is one formula that Bruckner and and Zellinger have come up with various formulas, but one of their formulas was this without the whole underlying theory. And this is the fundamental notion of information. Information is distinctions. Information is distinguishability. And Shannon never defined uh, information. He defined his notion of Shannon entropy. And, and uh, he, he said that's a measure of information, which it is. Uh, I shouldn't say measure. I should say the quantification of information. And uh, there are a lot of sort of potholes in the notion on Shannon entropy, which uh, I'm not going to go much into, <clears throat> but most basically, is Shannon defined all the compound notions of entropy, the central entropy, simple entropy of a probability distribution, and then the joint of two, then the conditional one, take away the other, or the mutual, and he defined them all so they had the usual Venn diagram relationship. Well, Venn diagrams come from measure theory. That's where Venn diagrams come from, usually the counting measure. And Shannon entropy is not a measure, not a measure in the sense of measure theory. And that's one of the fundamental problems is nobody since uh, Shannon's time has been able to define the set in which it's defined on as all measures are defined on a set. Vajo entry is a measure. And, and in fact, it's a probability measure. And it's equal to, uh, if you take have a partition, <clears throat> The logical entry of the partition is the two draw probability of getting a distinction. Just, just as the, the one draw probability is just the probability of getting an element in the subset, the two draw probability you draw independently twice from the universe and it's probability you'll get a distinction. And that generalizes to the quantum notion of, uh, as well, it's, uh, which is when, when, you, when you do two independent tests of, of the same state uh, by a, the same uh, observable, it's the probability that you'll get different eigenvalues. So, but I'm not going to go into that part of it. So, uh, this is the new information theory that we have, uh, and and uh, coming out of the new mathematical logic. And uh, this is 
been developed in a book uh, came out a year or so ago uh, where all this is spelled out and as well as the quantum version uh, spelled out and all my books are uh, on the usual uh, Russian sites if you know about them or uh, Anna's something called Anna's archives which is actually more stable now and and uh, so there's also a website of my buddies over in Zagreb called uh, www memory of the world all one word dot org and everything is there so uh then i have a, of course a book on quantum theory coming out with springer uh later on so start off with uh we have to reimagine what is going on in quantum theory with the principal non-classical notion which is the notion of superposition entanglement of course is a special case a particularly weird special case of superposition, but the main uh, problem is analyzing superposition. And it's certainly not the same as saying you're, you're simultaneously in two definite states. So the new interpretation of superposition, uh, which is behind what I'm saying, is that it's it's a state that's indefinite, objectively indefinite, between the various uh, eigenvalues of the eigenvectors that are in the superposition. So uh, the uh, major reconceptualization that's going on uh, mentally is get away from the wave uh, imagery of superposition as the addition of two waves. Uh, that's completely uh, there all the time because you're doing a vector space over the complex numbers, and complex number is always analyzed in your polar representation in terms of uh, amplitude and, and phase. So that's coming for free from the just the fact that you're dealing with complex numbers. And so this picture uh, there is the wrong picture of superposition. It's not mathematically wrong, it's ontologically wrong. And, and, and uh, we're talking about ontology here. Here's a nice quote from Dirac that says it very nicely, uh, that, that the, you should not take the waves uh, seriously uh, in ontological sense, uh, in wave so-called wave mechanics, because quantum superposition demands indeterminacy. So you you have a uh, case where the values are indeterminate, no superposition between here and there, you're not, uh, you have this indeterminacy between where you are. And, and uh, so you should not think of it in, term, in, in, in terms of waves. And as I said, the, the, the math is not wrong because the math of complex numbers is a natural mathematics to describe waves because it's amplitude and, and, and phase, but the imagery is wrong. And this is a big change for people to get away you got so much discussion now in philosophy of quantum mechanics, it's all about waves, uh, trying to take them ontologically, and, and uh, that's simply uh, barking up the wrong tree. Uh, why do we need complex numbers? Well, certainly one reason is that they're the algebraically complete field, that's extension of the reals. And so in order for all your observables to have a full set of eigenvectors, you need to have it over the complex numbers. And that's what uh, the... Uh, algebraic completeness gives you. But the wave mechanics is, is uh, the misleading artifact of the fact that you're doing uh, mechanics over the, or you're doing the math over Hilbert spade over C. And I slipped in here, uh, misleading, if not malicious. This of course refers back to Einstein's famous statement that, that uh, the Lord is subtle, but not malicious. And I think Einstein was going a little easy on the Lord. That, that this wave mechanics has misled the best minds in the galaxy for a century now with these wave ontologies. And so I think the Lord is a little bit uh, malicious or a joker or, or, or whatever, and that's what I put in there. So the real uh, point is to reimagine the superposition as something that is indefinite between the, uh, the values in the superposition and get away from this whole notion of waves as being somehow ontologically relevant. And uh, this, so superposition is state indefinite uh, between the superposed states and it's indefinite where they differ. It's not indefinite where they're, set, where they're the same. That, that if you have a series of eigenstates uh, that all are the same in some respect, then that whole superposition will have that definite value, but it's where they differ that it becomes indefinite. And what is interesting uh, in the philosophy of mathematics is that this is just the 
flip side of the notion of abstraction. Abstraction is where you, you put some things and you abstract out what is the same between them and make that definite and ignore the rest. Whereas superposition is the opposite. So you make indefinite where they differ, but you keep the make the definite where they're the same. So I have a picture here, two different examples. Uh, so here we have two isosceles triangles and, and the superposition, the plus here. So this triangle here is the correct way to think of the superposition visually, if you need visual uh, things. So where they differ, it becomes indefinite. So they differ in the B and C, the two isosceles, equal angles and the e equal sides. And so that becomes indefinite. But what is the same in both is the A, uh, capital A and the small a here. And so that survives. It's not equal to this silly idea that you're simultaneously uh, both the, the things. Uh, another example from uh, more sophisticated recent mathematics is, is in um, homotopy type theory. And the idea here is we're looking at the, uh, we have an annulus here, a ring with a hole in it, and you have a base point X zero, and you're looking at uh, uh, paths that go around the hole once uh, clockwise. And, and uh, so each path in, in homotopy theory is parameterized by the unit interval. So you have all these specific paths that go around. But if you abstract from that, taking the common elements, and that's what's done in the fundamental group. Remember the fundamental group of the annulus is just the, the uh, integers. Uh, and this would be the integer of positive one. Uh, then it is something that doesn't have a parameterization. It's not one of the things that you're parameterizing. It's something that's more abstract. And that notion of abstraction is exactly what's developed in homotopy type theory and, and another recent development in, in uh, century mathematical logic. So uh, the, the, the point I'm making here is, is that we should think of superposition as a fundamental logical concept. Uh, that's the flip side view of abstraction. Abstraction pulls out what's the same and, and is definite and, and the, the, uh, ignores the rest. Superposition is looking at another way around. You're, you're making where they differ indefinite and, and uh, whether the same will be uh, still definite. And this, this uh, connection, is a, I have a paper on it in, the, in a journal of philosophical logic, uh, never will occur to anybody who thinks of superposition as wave addition, it's just completely out of their ballpark. So uh, here's just repeating that uh, there. So uh, just, just to be a little more specific now about the, the math of indefiniteness, uh, a partition on a set U, use our universal set, and we'll keep it finite dimensional. Uh, Non-empty subsets called the blocks or the cells, and they are disjoint and their union is all of U. And remember a distinction is a ordered pair of elements from U that are in different blocks. And, and we're counting even here the, the, this ordered pair. So uh, each, each uh, it'll count twice because you have different, uh, different orders. So the uh, the indefiniteness indistinctions is is what's inside a block, and that's going to be the sort of skeletal. I'll explain in a minute. Skeletal notion of a superposition is is the two two points and that are inside the same block and thus are indefinite uh, or uh, or as as if they are sort of blobbed together and and uh, at the, at that level definiteness comes out in the in the uh, ordered pairs or in different blocks. And the set of indistinctions of a partition is just the equivalence relation. Equivalence relation is a subset of U cross U and it's complement in U cross U is the set of distinctions. And the set of, that's in computer science, they call it an apartness relation. And, and so this idea, uh, you can represent a partition uh, as this, set of blocks or you can also represent it by its dit set. It's got all the same uh, information there. Now the basic operation uh, on partitions uh, that comes out of the logic is the join of two partitions. And uh, the, the uh, so you have two partitions here, pi and, and sigma, uh, these are the blocks. So the join is formed by taking the blocks to be all the non-empty intersections. So obviously the, the BJs don't intersect each other, the CJs, but they can intersect 
each other from different the two different partitions. So you take all the non-empty ones, that forms a partition, and and the dit set of that, that's called the join, and the dit set of that partition is just a union of the two dit sets. So so the if you look at it from the other side from as an equivalence relation, this operation of join is just the intersection of equivalence relations. And everybody knows that the intersection of two equivalence relations is an is an equivalence relation, just the intersection of the two dit sets. So uh, those are just the basics that we're gonna need later on. Because uh, remember the thesis is that this math of partitions is just like the set version of the math of, of uh, quantum mechanics is the Hilbert space version of this very simple math uh, at the set level. So the key to go from uh, the set level to Hilbert space, uh, I mean, it's like if you start with Hilbert space and it's like a forgetful functor where you, you throw out the scalars and you throw out the, the operation. And, and I, rather than use the notion of forgetful functor, I'm calling that skeletonized. So you start with a particle state. And by the way, uh, these elements you rep are not, don't represent particles, they represent states of a particle, because that's what is superposed in a superposition or different states. Of, of a particle. So if you start with a particle state, this alpha i, alpha j, and all that, skeletonizing, you throw out the scalars, you throw out the kets, you throw out the, the addition or whatever the operation is, and you get just a set. The, 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 you, and so that, now we're going to talk about the skeletal model of quantum mechanics when you go from the Hilbert space, skeletonizing things back down and you arrive at the logic of partitions. So a singleton block, uh, when you do this, is essentially a classical state because there's no superposition involved. It's, it's just one, one state there. And so the non-singleton blocks correspond to partitions, I mean, uh, superpositions. And uh, I'll use several shorthands here. Uh, sometimes we represent the block containing ABC with that with parentheses around it. But when you do a big diagram like this, you want to just use the shorthand of ABC. It means when they're concatenated, that means they're in the same the same block. So uh, this is the di Hasse diagram, which means there's nothing intermediate between the the different partitions here of the skeletonized version of of a uh, Hilbert space where you have four four dimensions and and uh, four possible. Uh, states. So at the bottom, the indiscrete partition is where all those are combined together, throwing out the scalars, giving you the relative amount in which they were combined in the superposition. That's not relevant here. We want to understand superposition per se, not specific scalars. And that's the the what's called the indiscrete partition. And that stands, that's the pure state, basically. Uh, and then everything up to the discrete partition are mixed states, but they're non-classical mixed states because they all involve some uh, non-singleton blocks. So they involve a, a, a superposition and there may be some singleton blocks. But the classical, here is the classical realm, the, the um, uh, discrete partition, and what characterizes the classical realm is everything is distinguished. Every set, because it's in a singleton. All the, all the uh, states are in singleton, so there's distinguished that partition distinguishes them uh, uh, from each other. And we'll see in a minute how it satisfies certain notions of classicality. And by the way, uh, the logical entry here, uh, since the logical entry is always a, a probability, of course, it's always less than uh, one. And you see it going from zero for the pure state and then going up, I've drawn the levels here. So you have each, each partition at this level has a logical entry of three eighths and so forth. Uh, going up. So this is a picture of the classical world and the quantum world underneath it. And, and, and uh, the, where, where all the superpositions come in. And this is not a new concept. I mean, this is Heisenberg's notion of potentialities. Heisenberg had this idea of the, there exists a realm of potentia or potentialities, which he said are real, but not actual. And then he had the notion of measurement is where the potentialities become actual. Well, we don't need that sort of uh, different modalities because the partition world uh, takes all that into account. 
So what he, Heisenberg should have said is, is that we have this quantum world of, of states that, that involve some superposition, so they're not classical. And then we have the classical world uh, where all these states are distinguished from each other. And this same picture of, of the ontology of, of the classical world and then this, this world of, of um, underneath it, uh, like on the, what's under the water in an iceberg, uh, was also used by Shimoni, uh, a, a, uh, uh, my thesis advisor, and uh, uh, Maginot and R.I.G. Hughes in his book, uh, you all probably know, and uh, they, Mar uh, Marganau and, and Hughes use the language of latencies, but it's exactly the same notion. Uh, Heisenberg and Shimoni uh, use the word, the language of potentialities, but it's all, it's all real. There's no two different modalities of reality versus actuality. It's just the ones are, are involved in determinacy in the quantum world and in the classical world, you have no indeterminacy. So uh, one of the uh, criteria of classicality uh, goes back at least to Leibniz uh, and, and uh, their picture of the classical world was something that's definite all the way down. If you borrow the language from the turtles all the way down, it was definite all the way down. So if you have two allegedly two different things, uh, morning star and the evening star or something, if you go down deep enough, uh, if they're distinct, they will be some predicate that applies to one and not the other. And, and uh, that's Leibniz's principle of identity of indiscernibles or uh, the identity of indistinguishables, I would rather say. And, and uh, uh, if, if there is no, as you go deeper, 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 there's no predicate that separates the two, this is what Kant called the principle of complete determination, uh, then they have to be the same. They have all the same properties. And uh, that was their definition of the classical world, one of them. They also had the you know, principle of sufficient reason, the principle uh, of continuity and so forth, all of which are violated uh, in quantum mechanics. And uh, it turns out that, that the prediction logical version of this law of identity of indiscernibles is right here. So if you have two elements that are indistinguishable by the classical partition, then they're the same. And that's a trivial mathematical thing because when everything's been distinguished, the only thing that hasn't been distinguished are the self pairs. You can't distinguish anything from itself. And so if you've got two things that are indistinguishable uh, by the discrete partition, they have to be the same. Trivial, but it's interesting that that notion of classicality comes right out of partition logic uh, that, that, uh, that Leibniz had as, as a criteria of classicality. Uh, now, remember my thesis is that the mathematics of quantum mechanics and Hilbert space is really the Hilbert space version of the mathematics of partitions. So we're gonna start out with the three mathematical tools uh, in, in uh, quantum mechanics, quantum states, quantum observables, and quantum measurements, and show that they all come from the Hilbert space version of partition math. So we're seeing where the math comes from. We're following the math back down to where, to where it actually comes from. So let's start with quantum states. So remember the set level, we have partitions. They're the skeletal representation of, of quantum states. So the trick here is to reformulate a partition as a density matrix. And, and, uh, and then you'll, you'll see, I did it here for a simple uh, partition where A and C are identified or together in a block, they're in a superposition, and B and D are in a superposition. <clears throat> and I got point probabilities here, and then the block probabilities are here. And so for each block, you define this uh, vector BJ, and then you form the density matrix as the block probabilities times this projection, the BJs, the, the, the outer, outer product of the BJs. And you'll get this thing here. Now, the, this represents all the information that's in the partition because you see A and C are cohere together in a superposition. Now, what is a coherent, what is coherence in the quantum notion of a density matrix? It's a non-zero off-diagonal element in the density matrix. And that's exactly what we got here. Here's the off-diagonal. These two things here are the off-diagonal elements to show that A and C are in the same block of the partition. 
And this is the off-diagonal element, non-zero off-diagonal, to show that B and D are in the same block. And so the non-zero off-diagonal elements are just your indistinctions, just your things that are pulled together uh, in an equivalence class, if you think of a block as an equivalence class. <clears throat> and your zero elements are your distinctions. So when you distinguish two elements one way or another, as we'll see in measurement, uh, that zeroes out the elements. And then you ask, well, what about the block probabilities? Uh, where is that? Well, this is a matrix. It's a density matrix. And density matrix has eigenvalues. And the eigenvalues are exactly the block probabilities of this of the density matrix. And, and uh, in this case, they are 5 twelfths and 7 twelfths, and the rest are filled up by zeros because you've got more dimensions than you've got uh, blocks. And so this, uh, these facts all generalize directly to the general uh, Hilbert space version. Hilbert space uh, density matrix rho is Hermitian and positive. So there's an orthonormal set of eigenvectors. These are all represent orthonormal states, orthonormal, but they disjoint and then orthonormal. Uh, and and the, uh, they have non-zero eigenvalues that sub to one. And uh, these, I must say, these uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues don't get much respect in the quantum literature, but they're very important because they are they give you the the general Hilbert space version of exactly the the density matrix for partitions that I just gave you. So here's the table. We're, we're constructing dictionaries here that go from the set partition math to the Hilbert space math, and and so these BJs were were uh, you know, orthonormal, and that's the same with the eigenvectors of a general uh, density matrix. Uh, the eigenvalues were the block probabilities, and these are the same uh, here. And the the uh, density matrix is uh, uh, constructed as the, the probabilities time the projections. Exactly the same thing in the spectral decomposition of the uh, density matrix. It's these eigenvalues times the projections down the U's. Coherence meant, you know, uh, if, if the row of pi JK was non-zero, it means they're in the same block. And that's exactly what's called coherence in general density matrices in, in uh, quantum theory. Pure state, uh, take a pure state here. So what are the eigenvalues of a pure state density matrix? One, and the rest are zeros. And that's exactly the, the uh, eigenvalues of the pure state, which which you see at the bottom of that that uh, uh, partition lattice is the indiscrete partition where everything is blobbed together in a pure state. So a complete dictionary uh, here. So we see how the the uh, representation of quantum states in the density matrix formulas and forget wave functions density matrix formulation is just the Hilbert space version of the partition math uh, of, of partitions. So let's go to the next concept. Let's go to observables. So here, it turns out uh, there's a semi-algorithmic procedure. It's part of the mathematical folklore used by Herman Weil and a bunch of other people, where you take set concepts and you translate them into vector space concepts. And uh, uh, Jean Calarota, uh, my mentor, uh, used to call this a, a, a yoga. A yoga was like a it's not an algorithm, it's, it's a procedure by which you transform concepts from one field into another field and it's not totally rigorous. You've got to perhaps make some decisions as you do it, but that's that's the uh, uh, yoga of linearization. So here's the yoga. You take a set U and you apply the set concept to U and then you interpret U as a basis set for the vector space and you see what does that set concept apply to the basis set the vector space generate. So uh, the universe generates the whole uh, space, obviously, by definition. And the cardinality of the, uh, well, a subset obviously generates a subspace, and the cardinality of the whole space uh, transforms into the dimension of the vector space. So you get this dictionary uh, going back and forth between uh, set concepts, which we have with our partitions, and vector space concepts here. And of course, you can think of, well, there's the, there's the free, ve free uh, vector space function from category sets to vector spaces over K. 
but the yoga is much richer than that. That's that that's just sort of the beginning, and and uh, unless you're a fanatic about category theory, you you want to look at the yoga, which gives you much more richer thing. So let's start now with the set notion of a uh, real valued uh, numerical attribute. So in logic, you think of maybe a property which is zero one, but but a real valued attribute. This is like weight or height or a number of people or something. And and uh, that's a set concept. It defines, remember the values of U are a basis set. Now, when we go to the vector space version, so yoga says define the operator on the basis set as F small f of U times U. So that defines an operator because it's defined on a basis set. So that's the correspondence that starts off between numerical attributes and, and real valued operators. Uh, in the vector space case, we have the eigenvector eigenvalue equation that uh, whatever satisfies this is, is an eigenvector of, of F and R is an eigenvalue. And this is the set version, F restricted to a subset S equals RS. Interpret that to mean that F is constant on S, constant value. And, and so that means that the eigenvectors in a set version of an eigenvector is just a constant set of a function. Is, is that, that's the set version of an eigenvector. The eigenvalues are obviously just the values. And in the vector space version, uh, you have the projection operators, uh, which are uh, have eigenvalues zero and one. So that would correspond to a function that had only the value of zero one. And that's, those are called characteristic functions or indicator functions uh, in, in, in logic. And <clears throat> so you start with those and then you can define a projection operator on the subspace generated by S here uh, it is defined this way. And then you have the spectral decomposition in the vector space case that the, the whole operator is the, defined as the sum of the eigenvalues times the projections to the eigenspaces. And here is the spectral decomposition ordinary function of the real numbers, which I don't know if this is in the literature, but you take the, all the values in the image F of U, namely all the eigenvalues, times the characteristic function, because we saw that characteristic functions are the analog, set analog of projection operators in, in Hilbert space. So you have a spectral decomposition on both sides of your function and your operator. And of course, the set of uh, eigenvectors, in other words, R constant subsets would be the power set of F inverse of U. And that corresponds to the eigenspace uh, for the R eigenvector. So we have our dictionary now built up between set concepts and vector space concepts. We're particularly interested in it when the vector space is, is the Hilbert space. So uh, what about partition? So you have a, the set U and you, you look at a partition on that set. So it divides it up into these blocks. And then you say, what does that generate? So each of those blocks generates a subspace. So what is the, what's the characteristic of the subspaces generated by a set partition of a basis set? And here's the answer, it's a direct sum decomposition. So it's a direct sum decomposition, you remember, is, is a set of, uh, uh, of subspaces of a space, such that every vector in the, in the uh, space has a unique representation of a, a vector from each of those elements, each of those subspaces. And so it's a direct sum, it's unique, unique. And, and uh, so, that's the Hilbert space version of a partition is a direct sum decomposition. And, and uh, uh, ordinary partition, the, the disjoint union, which is the direct sum in sets uh, of the blocks uh, is the U. And here we have the vector space. The whole vector space is the direct sum of the eigenspaces here. Or, or, well, I'm gonna say the eigenspaces later on, but direct sum decomposition is a general notion. So, <clears throat> Okay, so that gives us the uh, the the uh, uh, partition treatment of, of quantum states, partition treatment of quantum observables as these direct sum decompositions, and so uh, or or the, or the the real valued uh, Hermitian uh, observables that have those uh, vector spaces. So uh, we have 
Now, two different partitions here. We have the pi, which gave us the density matrix rho of pi. And we had this, this uh, uh, numerical attribute at the set level. And of course, its inverse image is a partition. That's, that's the uh, uh, how you get uh, the set of these F inverse of, of R. And uh, in quantum mechanics, a projective measurement is the application of observable to a state. So let's do that. Let's, let's apply the observable we've got here in both the set level and the uh, vector space, uh, Hilbert space level to the state. And how do you represent that measurement? Well, that's the Luter's mixture operation. The Luter's mixture operation represents the result on the density matrix of, of a projective measurement. So let's do the set version of a Luter's mixture operation because we have the dictionary to translate these things back and forth. So the Luter's mixture operation, you remember you pre and post multiply your pre-measurement density matrix by these projections. So in this case, it's just the simple diagonal matrices projected down to the, the F inverse of R, sum it over R, and you'll get the post-measurement uh, density matrix rho hat. What is rho hat? It is just the join. It's the density matrix of the join. So now we, we have a complete dictionary translating the, the, the join operation at the set level is the corresponding prefigures, the corresponding thing to the projective measurement at the, at the uh, Hilbert space level, both represented by the appropriate uh, uh, Luter's mixture operation and uh, give that down here, set concept, and the Luter's mixture operation here. So this, 10 minutes, okay. Um, well, so here is the representation here of what's going on in a very simple partition lattice. The If you apply this uh, partition here as the operator, this partition here as the set, then we, they get the join. And since this is a Hasse diagram, the join is where they meet. In this case, it was a so-called maximal measurement. So the join is, is this uh, maximally separated uh, thing. But the ontology is you're going from this state here by the arrow to this state here, and that's a jump. So this is the set level version of, of, of a quantum jump. And, and uh, how do you, if you want to think of this in sort of Greek terms, the way Heisenberg used to think about it in Greek terms, you use the notions of substance versus form. So if you look at the classical Boolean uh, lattice here, the bottom was zero substance, the null set. And then you start adding substance, you get to the universe of ABC. And there's no, uh, every, everything that's uh, created here doesn't change its characteristics. In the dual version, that, that is the skeletal model for quantum mechanics, the pure state is where you have all the substances there, but there's no form. There's no information. There's no distinction. Other information is distinctions, remember. And you advance up to one of these things here by making distinctions. And as we saw, the, the uh, projective measurement is, is just uh, going from, jumping from one level to another by making distinctions, by informing the prior state with distinctions, which then gives you uh, the, the new state. So this is the partition version of distinction making change. And, and uh, let me uh, go on here. Uh, so that's, I've, so I've handled the quantum states, quantum observables and uh, projective management all in, in the uh, Hilbert space version, just the Hilbert space version of the partition math uh, there. So let's now uh, quickly go over some of the other uh, applications of all this. Uh, uh, it's often said that the, you know unique one of the unique things about quantum math is a, is the non-commutative non uh, uh, observables. So let's start with two uh, direct sum decompositions of two op operators f and g. So here's f, vi on the side, and then we do like we would do for two partitions. We take the intersection of the spaces. So vi intersects with vj. So you take the ones that are non non-zero, 
And and uh, what is in those? Well, those are simultaneous eigenvectors, obviously, because it's the, from uh, VI and, and, and WJ are eigenvectors of those two operators. And so you get uh, this new set of subsets, which are these sets of simultaneous eigenvectors. And now you get some new stuff because Hilbert space is much more complicated than the set case. So those uh, intersecting uh, uh, subspaces don't necessarily span the whole space. So uh, let's call that space they do span SE for simultaneous eigenvector space. Then let's say, okay, let's look at the commutator. Here's the usual commutator. It's a linear operator. So it has a kernel. Kernel is the, the, the uh, set of vectors that get mapped to zero. And the theorem is that the simultaneous eigenvector state is the kernel of the commutator. Okay, now when do you say they commute? It's so when the kernel, everything goes to zero by the commutator. So it's, it's the whole space is in the kernel. So now we have the definition of commutability, ignoring the operators, just looking at the, these uh, direct sum decompositions, which are the vector space version of a partition, remember? So if, the, if SE is the whole space, they commute. If it's not the whole space, they don't. And, and they're conjugate if the simultaneous eigenvector space is the zero space. So the, the whole treatment of commutivity can just comes right up uh, from the partition treatment. And, and so, uh, for and, and so you this operation, which I said is join like, it's not actual join unless they commute because it doesn't span the whole space. So uh, as Vial said, the combination of two gradients, gradients was Vial's uh, language for uh, direct sum decompositions, presupposes commutability, which is correct because then then you have a real join because yeah, the, the the all those subspaces span the whole space. Now we get the set version and we get the Hilbert space version. Uh, pretty simple. You've got a bunch of uh, numerical attributes and they all have their inverse image partitions. So you take the join and, and uh, if the join has each subset block, cardinality one, then and only then can you, uh, can you uh, take the ordered set of values and uniquely characterize the UIs. And then you do the Hilbert space version. Well, that's just DRX, uh, Costco's, because now we have commuting observables. And so you can take the join and, and uh, the, where you have uh, cardinality one, now you have dimension one. So if the join has D, all the DSDs or dimension one, uh, then the simultaneous eigenvectors can be uniquely determined by the ordered set of eigenvalues. So DRX was just doing the Hilbert space version of the set version here. Moving on, let's go to von Neumann's two processes. Uh, where does the Schrodinger equation come into this uh, interpretation? Well, von Neumann had these two processes, everybody knows. Type one is measurements. And uh, we've already seen that measurements are the things that introduce distinctions. So how would you characterize uh, this evolution by the Schrodinger equation? Well, it would be uh, a evolution that doesn't make distinctions. Well, the, the extent to which two uh, quantum states are distinct is the inner product. And, and so the natural characterization of type two is evolution that does not change the inner product between two states. And that gives you the very simple, using these notions of distinguishability, uh, definition between type one and type two. And of course, as you know, the, the uh, evolution that doesn't uh, change the inner product is unitary evolution. And, and uh, so that's the uh, treatment of uh, type one and type two. And then you say, well, let's not forget Schrodinger's equation. Well, the connection is obviously Stone's theorem that, that connects unitary transformations and the solutions to the Schrodinger equation. So here we have the two processes. One is the process that introduces distinctions and makes us jump. Here we have unitary evolution. And the important thing to notice is that unitary evolution takes place at, can take place at the quantum level. It's not uh, something that takes place at the classical level at the top. And, and that's very important to understand uh, something like the uh, what happens in the double slit experiment and so forth. Now, let's go to uh, the collapse hypothesis. Uh, the the uh, lot of philosophers of physics are uh, harping on this question of uh, what separates measurement from non-measurement. And this was spelled out by 
Feynman in 1954, in his 51 maybe, in his paper on quantum probability, it's the distinguishability between alternative ways to go to A to B. If you can distinguish between the alternative ways from go to A to B, uh, then you add together the probabilities because that means some management has been involved there. You've collapsed the uh, superposition. And if you cannot distinguish, so the, the characteristic here, this is the Feynman rules. If you cannot distinguish the final states, even in principle, it doesn't matter whether you look or not, it has nothing to do with uh, macroscopic measurement devices and all that junk. Uh, then you add the amplitudes and, and then take the absolute square at the end. So the distinction between unitary evolution and, and measurement was there all along in, in the Feynman rules. Is the, are the, these uh, uh, states, their alternative ways, are they distinguishable or not? And Feynman gave examples. So first of all, let me point out that Feynman gave examples all at the quantum level. He didn't talk about this, uh, you know, macroscopic uh, measurement thing, and where's the shifty split between micro and macro, and we're, and if you have macro, then you got the Zeck Zurich decurrence. None of that, none of that's in Feynman. Feynman gave examples at the quantum level, and one of the favorite ones is you have a particle scattering off atoms in a crystal, and can you tell after the scattering which atom it scattered particle scattered off of? And if you cannot distinguish. Uh, which which particle, uh, which atom in the crystal is scattered off of? Then you add amplitudes. Otherwise, uh, you 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 if it if you can tell the difference, for example, if you had spin up and the scattering flip the spin, uh, then then you have uh, uh, you 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 have a measurement and you add the, the probabilities. So uh, here I give Shannon's uh, implicit principle. Here I give a statement from the philosophers. It seems unbelievable that a fundamental distinction between measurement and non-measurement, somehow the fundamental theory should treat all processes the same way. Well, Feynman gave the distinction back in 1951 in that Berkeley Symposium on, on quantum probability. So I'm almost finished. Let me just, uh, give, here is the, uh, if you want an image of, of measurement, think of this round blob here as the superposition of all these uh, uh, distinct like eigenstates uh, here. And so you've got a triangle, uh, square, pentagon, and hexagon. So measurement is, is, is where the Luter's mixture operation takes you from that pure state to this mixed state. And then it's a normal mixed state uh, with some probability you'll get one of the things in the mixed state. And, and the end state is, is determined by Luter's rule. And that's spelled out in uh, uh, R.I.G. Hughes's book, and and so the distinction here is is you can't pass through this blob cannot pass through this grating uh, without uh, taking on a characteristic. Here is a case of where there's no state reduction; it can pass through the grating without any distinction. And this was built up by Eddington uh, uh, in that chapter. In in Viles, Val uses this this uh, notion of sieve or, or grading from Eddington. And, and uh, in that, I think it's the third appendix of the National Natural Philosophy of uh, Mathematics and Science, something like that, standard book. But the third appendix on quantum mechanics is beautiful. And he, he gives the whole, uses the whole yoga, uh, starts out with a grading, which is just a set with equivalence relation, in other words, a partition. And then he says the quantum case is an aggregate of end states replaced by n-dimensional Euclidean space, where it splits the total space into mutually orthogonal, just the direct sum decomposition. So the whole thing was there in Vial uh, all along, and then Vial does that. So this is my conclusion. Here's your dictionary uh, set version with partitions, uh, the Hilbert space version for states, for observables, for measurement. And then we did all these other cases here. And, and uh, so I just want to emphasize that this is not some sort of jerry-rigged uh, stuff to suddenly uh, provide an interpretation to quantum mechanics. Th this is a development out of mathematical logic and the developing the other mathematical logic besides the, the logic of subsets, the logic of partitions, quantitizing to get logical entropy, which then fits very well uh, into uh, quantitizing these things and, and, uh, and then provides this whole dictionary between uh, partition math and and uh, 
Hilbert Space Math. So uh, Shimoni called this the liberal, literal interpretation. I would call it either that or, or objective indefinite interpretation of quantum mechanics. It's a realistic interpretation. It gives you that image, skeletonized image of the of, of uh, what uh, it looks like when you when you skeletonize the the uh, thing. So you get some build up some imagery. It's based on throwing away the wave imagery, which is always there anyway, has nothing to do with uh, quantum mechanic reality. And it shows that the mathematics, the specific mathematics of quantum mechanics, not the physics, the physics is obtained as usual by quantification, quantization, and and the math of quantum mechanics is just the Hilbert space version of partition math, and that tells you the fundamental reality is indefiniteness and, and the classical realities where everything is definite. So thank you. This is, these are the two papers that have already been published in foundations and in the quantum foundations thing, uh, my website and a book forthcoming with spring. Thank you. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Uh, <clears throat> and David, I, I thought that was uh, fascinating and I, and I can see how uh, the partition and set idea would simulate the vector spaces uh, idea. Um, though it seems to me though that there are things that you would have to put in by hand in a partition uh, theory that arise quite naturally in a wave theory, which is what I'm going to talk about in the next talk. Um, one, for instance, is wavelength, which doesn't seem to have any... Uh, the, the what? Wa wavelength. Yeah, yeah, no, that comes in by quantification. Qu yes, so, quantization. So, so, um, so... See, I never mentioned Planck's constant, any of that stuff. This is just the math. Yeah, yeah, sure. The physics comes in by quantization. I have nothing, no problem there. That's all fine. And then, sure. then that is formulated in the unique mathematics of quantum mechanics, and this is where that math comes from. Sure. But in practice, um, for instance, in neutron interferometry, where the wavelengths can be macroscopic, you've got to take these things into account. Um, yeah. Well, that's a small point, anyway. I'm, yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reacting I'm not doing, to your... I'm not doing physics here. I'm doing... Yes, yeah, sure. Where does the math come from? I'm reacting to your... And that uh, turns dismissal out dismissal of wave mechanics, which I'm going to talk about next. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, this doesn't say much for De Broly and company. Uh, my com uh, comment goes in the same direction. Uh, what do you think of the idea of connecting uh, the partitions with uh, with uh, parti partition of the wave? Uh, this is, uh, if you like, look at the Benros uh, tiles, for instance, and the Conway decoration, uh, this uh, goes also with the idea of, um, uh, in string theory, they had also the idea to attach um, a, a bit of a string to the face of the space uh, partition. And, oh, and the second question would be then, uh, could we not... Uh, think of the of the nature of space uh in terms of eigenvalues if um and my question will be also how do you derive this um seven uh, vectors from the from the zero point on this uh, image the partition lattice okay i'm not sure i heard your question very well um but certainly the the to address the last question, the 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 um, notion of, of superposition uh, is very important, I think, in making the transition to general relativity. The thing that hung up Einstein for about five years or so uh, was trying to uh, see how space could be covariant if the points in space were identifiable, and the solution to that sort of a problem is to make make it so the points are not yet identifiable. And that means you're in a superposition of points of space. And then you have to see what is it that distinguishes points and that those are masses. And so you get an approach to general relativity, which I'm working on now, but I haven't, uh, I'm, I'm way behind on that. <laughs> 
thanks. Uh, thanks for that. that I find myself sympathetic to quite a lot of what you had to say. Um, I just have a clarifatory question, I guess. So you you say you're, you're you want to focus on the math, not on the physics, right? Um, that on the one hand, but then on the other hand, you you, you made you made a couple statements, made a statement a couple of times that um, quantum kind of. Uh, that what's what's manifest is objective and determinism. And so given that you're not talking about the physics, I wonder if you could clarify a little bit more what you meant by objective in that context. Well, I, I mean, it, it, see, what most people talk about in talk about reconstruction, they're trying to take on the math and the physics at the same time. And I don't think that's cutting the bones at the joint. I'm trying to cut the bones at the joint and, and say the math is one thing, the physics comes over by quantization, and and we see where the math comes from, and you have th this this uh, uh, you, you know uh, Heisenberg's uh, whole thing about uh, where is it? Well, somewhere here, yeah, here. Um, this this diagram, Heisenberg, Shimoni, Marganau, all these people uh, said that you have this world of what they call potentialities or latencies, which are characterized by indeterminacy. In other words, the, 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 the observables don't necessarily have a definite value. And, and that's, so I'm not inventing any of that, but that's, it comes out naturally from this treatment. That's the rest of the, that's the rest of the, of the, par the partition lattice when you skeletonize everything. That takes you back to, you know, the notion, notion of, to understand superposition, you don't need all that junk. You don't need the 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 uh, um, you know the scalars or the addition or the cats. You just have the basic notion of these uh, different states are in a block together. So they're not distinguished. Things that are in different blocks are distinguished, and so you get the notion of, of superposition coming out the set level, and that turns out to be exactly uh, you know carries right through to measurement. Uh, Quantum states, quantum observables, projective measurement, and so forth, and and so that's the way this notion of the quantum underworld. This is the quantum underworld here. This is the quantum world skeletonized. I mean, it, that's below the water. The classical world is what's above the water. Everything's distinguished, and and uh, and and so uh, we get a coherent picture of what's going on, but it's, you know, hugely simplified, obviously, because I've skeletonized, you know, thrown away the scalars, but, you know, you can have superposition. Uh, the concept uh, is more basic than needing to have scalars. And, and uh, so when you through do all that, you get a partition lattice. And, and definiteness and indefiniteness comes right out of that. And, I just have a very quick question. Have you thought about POVMs in your partition approach? No, no, we're just using standard uh, projective measurement here. Okay. Thank you. I mean, why, it's quite complicated. If I know <laughs> just one question of my own. Um, so you introduced the logical entropy and you have a, you, you introduced the logical entropy. Right, you had right. an explicit formula for that, which sure. is intriguing. Because it's like it's like the Bruckner Zeilinger, one of their entropies. Yeah, yeah, it is. But I didn't see where you used that. Did you make use of that explicit form? Uh, well, in the underlying paper and in the book, yeah. Right. right. <laughs> I mean, take for example, uh, projective measurement given to you by the Luter's mixture operation. So you transform one density matrix into the post measurement density. Okay. And what happens there is certain entries in the matrix stay the same and certain entries go to zero. Those ones that go to zero are the ones that are distinguished. The member distinction is a zero in the density matrix and the ones that stay the same are the incoherences. So if you measure the logical entropy before the measurement and after the measurement, it is exactly the difference. Between, it's those things that go to zero absolute squared. So logical entry measures measurement very concrete way by what happens to each entry in the density matrix. And of course, the von, Neum the von Neumann entry is a great name attached to it, but doesn't give you any of that. And All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>